Okay, so this is a presentation on skin disorders from Chapter 8. So, <clears throat> just a very quick review of skin, the anatomy and physiology of it. Um, the outer layer of skin is called the epidermis. It is a um, epithelial layer which means it's avascular, all epithelia are avascular. It's supported by the dermis, which is a connective tissue, um, non-living, um, mostly matrix. And then a subcutaneous la uh, layer called the hypodermis, um, which is mostly made of, of fat. <clears throat> In the epidermis, the, um, there are five layers, four for sure, five in thick skin, stratum basale, stratum granulosum, um, uh, str I'm sorry, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidium, and stratum keratosum. Uh, the youngest cells are at the base the oldest cells are at the surface. Uh, the reproducing layer is in the stratum basale. Um, and as the cells age, they're pushed up by the new cells underneath them. As they age, they fill up with keratin, which is a waterproofing protein, which eventually kills the cells. So the stratum corneum, the outer layer, is mostly dead cells filled with keratin. Granulosa has a lot of keratin in it, but they're in granules. Um, lucidium is full of keratin, but still alive. Um, spinosum is uh, where they are starting to develop the protein synthesizing the rough ER, so there's very little keratin in those, and the stratum basale is where mitosis happens. Now, there's a, another couple of types of cells uh, in this epithelium. One is melanocytes. <clears throat> melanocytes live in the stratum uh, basale, and their job is to produce a pigment um, that protects the skin from ultraviolet radiation. So when it, they produce the pigment, the pigment goes into the interstitial space, enters the keratinocytes and stains them. And the color of the pigment varies depending on the person. Um, mine happens to have a reddish hue to it. Other people are more chocolate hue. Some people are more olive green. Some people are more yellow. Uh, and some combination of that. Melanin is important for protecting. Um, if there is, um, if the melanocytes are far apart, you end up with freckles, um, areas of, of higher pigment than others. There's also the Langerhans cells uh, and um, the Merkel cells. Merkel cells are touch sensors and Langerhans are fixed macrophages. Um, we won't get into those right now. <clears throat> there is a um, condition, a genetic condition called albinism, albinos. Uh, they lack the ability to produce melanin, whether they lack melanocytes or they the gene for melanin is turned off. So um, these people have very white hair and very white skin and often their eyes are pink because the um, the melanin that is in the back of the eyeball that stops light from reflecting isn't there so uh, light reflects out and from the blood vessels, they, it ends up looking pink. 
Vitiligo is uh, areas of hypopigmentation. It's like the uh, melanocytes die in a certain area. Um, and so people will have patchy color. Uh, the darker your skin pigmentation, the more noticeable vitiligo is. Um, this is the disease that Michael Jackson claimed that he had, and that's why he had to have his skin bleached to make it even. Um, melasma is patches of darker skin, so this is hyperpigmentation in small. It's kind of the opposite of vitiligo. So all of this happens in the epidermis. The supporting layer, the connective tissue layer, is called the dermis. Um, there are some cells, fibrocytes and other things uh, in there, but the vast majority of it is extracellular matrix, which is non-living outside the cell secretions of the cells. It lasts a long time. It's mostly elastic and collagen fibers. As we age, it becomes more collagen and less elastic. It's what gives skin its strength, and its flexibility. It is where these sensory receptors are for pressure, touch, pain, heat, cold. Uh, it's where the blood vessels and the nerves all are. Uh, it, uh, it nourishes the uh, stratum basale of the epidermis. Um, it's what you have to get to when you're getting a tattoo. If you put ink on the epidermis, the, it will stain the keratinocytes. And within a few days, those keratinocytes will flake off and the pattern will be gone. That's why henna doesn't stay. But if you actually use a needle and puncture down into the collagen fibers of the dermis, that stuff is extracellular and non-living, so it doesn't shed. It doesn't go away, and that's why the tattoo stays. Hypodermis is mostly fat. Um, there's some loose connective tissue. Um, there's big blood vessels. There's larger nerves. Um, and there's some macrophages that, are, that work in there, and it's all part of the... Uh, next line of defense. It provides uh, cushioning. It provides um, that first line of defense. Um, it helps insulate uh, to keep body temperature constant. Those sorts of things. The appendages of the skins are things like hairs uh, and sweat glands. The eccrine glands uh, are sweat glands. <clears throat> the uh, sebaceous glands re release sebum, which is um, a lipid substance that keeps the hair, uh, so it releases it into the hair follicles, keeps the hair supple. Um, there's lots of nerve endings at the base of the hair follicle because the main job of hair is uh, a sensory. It, it provides um, leverage. So a little bit of, like if a fly lands on you or a mosquito lands on you, you know it because they disturb the hair. If you have no hair, you, you don't notice it as much. So, <clears throat> first line of defense is the function. Prevents you from dehydrating, excessive fluid loss, controls body temperature, sensory perception, the sense of touch, uh, mostly. And this is uh, where vitamin D gets synthesized uh, from cholesterol as provided by the body, and the energy comes from ultraviolet sunlight. Now, it's an inactive form of cholesterol. It has to be activated by the kidneys, as we saw in the urinary section. <clears throat> Normally, the skin um, has a flora and fauna. There's 
various bacteria and things that live on our skin. Um, most of them are important for health. Uh, they're supposed to be there. We have them down in the hair follicles, in the glands, uh, <clears throat> underneath the fingernails, etc. But if there's problems, especially with the immune system, um, then we can have opportunistic infections of these flora. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, the flora is normally kept under balance, and if something offsets the balance, then it can become an opportunistic effect. Infection. Um, and if it gets through the skin, and it can become systemic, it can spread by the um, by blood and lymphatics. Okay, and so there's a couple of different types of skin lesions that we we have definitions for. We'll be looking at. Um, and we we look at the physical appearance and we describe it. But what can cause skin lesions could be a systemic disorder, like, for instance, a liver disease or um, some sort of perineoplastic disease, things like that. can be a systemic infection, chickenpox, smallpox, allergies. Um, you can break out in hives and stuff like that. Or localized factors on the skin. Um exposure to toxins, etc. So, <clears throat> we, when we describe a skin lesion, we identify its location. So, on the dorsum of the left hand, um, between the thumb and index finger, sort of thing. But, um, it's been there for 10 days. <clears throat> it seems to be growing. It's elevated, it's oozing, it's itchy. So, pruritus is itching. So, that would be an example of how you would, um, you would talk about it. So, here's some common lesions. Um, I will post another video from a different course uh, where I do a little... Uh, video on this um, and you can review that but we'll do this anyways so a macule is like a flat circumscribed mark so like a freckle would be a macule it's there's nothing raised or depressed in the skin uh, and it's very well defined what is and what is not Part of that lesion. Um, birthmarks can be considered macules. Nodules are a raised, firm to the touch um, lesion. They tend to go as deep or deeper than they are raised. So they will extend down. Uh, into the dermis, maybe. A papule, on the other side, on the other hand, isn't deep. A papule is a small, solid elevation. Um, now, a pustule is raised. It can go a little bit deep. It is filled with an exudate. It's filled with pus. That's why it's called a pustule. Oftentimes they have a head. So a pimple is a, a pustule. A vesicle is what we call a blister. Uh, it's thin-walled, raised up, and filled with interstitial fluid. It's filled with fluid. Those are vesicles. So... Um, Shingles is a vesicular rash. A plaque is uh, an elevated but flat on top. It's like a scale type lesion. So psoriasis is plaque. 
An ulcer is an erosion. It's a cavity down into the tissue, and it will go all the way to the to the dermis. Bed sores are ulcers. Um, they heal from the edges in. Fissure is a crack. Uh, a lot of people get fissures in their fingertips and their toes and things like that. I mean, there's a few more, but those are the, the basic ones. So this is the, the same table uh, form of this. So a crust is a dry, rough surface. It's usually dried exudate. Uh, might be dried blood. Um, we see this, in, for instance, in impetigo. Lichenification is a leather-like rough surface. A lot of times when people have chronic dermatitis, subacute dermatitis, they end up with a lichenification. It looks like lichen is growing on you. Um, a keloid is uh, a raised scar. Some people, when they scar, they end up with this raised irregular mass of collagen. Um, we've already said fissure and ulcer. Uh, erosion um, is the start of an ulcer. It doesn't make it down to the dermis. Um, a comden is a mass of sebum and keratin. It, it's the, it blocks the opening of a hair follicle. Um, the sebum builds up in there. Okay, pruritus is just itchiness. It usually is indicative of something. Uh, could be an allergic response, could be some sort of a chemical irritation or burn, um, infestation with parasites. It could just be indicative of uh, a lesion being um, healing, because oftentimes as they heal, they're itchy. Um, as common as itching is, we really don't know why it happens. Um, there's a release of histamine and there's a, um, um, an inflammatory process around it, but how that manifests as itch, we're not entirely sure. <clears throat> the biggest problem with itching is you scratch, and as you scratch, you can introduce uh, infections. Um, it's a common thing for people to be scratching at mosquito bites, for instance, and end up with a cellulitis, um, an infection of the skin. Um, or you can get a, a, a deeper infection. And if you're um, any way immunocompromised, it can be worse. Uh, Scratching at things is not a good plan. So when we get skin lesions, we, uh, if there's a pus or anything, you, you can culture that and, and, and see what kind of bacteria are involved. Um, you know, it depends on what you think it, it is. So if there's a fungal or parasitic infection, you can, do, you can look at it directly. Biopsy is very useful in things that you think might be cancerous. Uh, you're, what they often do is they remove the lesion, remove the skin lesion, and then biopsy it to make sure that it wasn't malignant. If it was, then they follow up with radiation or chemo. Um, blood tests are not done very often in, for skin lesions, but if there's something caused by allergy or something like that. Uh, very common is skin testing, patch or scratch. Uh, your, uh, an allergist would, will look at that um, and try and identify if there's something that you have an allergy to that's irritating.
most lesions are itchy and so we use topical agents to stop that uh, antihistamines glucocorticoids so benadryl and that kind of thing you'll often see prescribed just to help manage the symptoms um, way better to avoid the allergens um, if there's an infection antibiotics either topical or systemic um, if there's a lesion that's cancerous or precancerous removing it is probably a good idea burning it off um, or freezing it off um, I had a um, little lesion right on my collarbone and I went to the dermatologist and I thought he was going to do a real thorough investigation of it and he looked at it and said well it's one of about three things um, he said you know it could be a, a basal cell carcinoma it could be um, a little herpes lesion it could be and just sun damage a little precancerous lesion I, I don't know and he just as he's talking to me he turned around and he grabbed the liquid nitrogen I didn't realize what it was and he just pssst, froze it off right then and there and he said no sense in wasting any time in trying to figure out exactly what it is when the treatments are all the same and it's never re reoccurred so that was six years ago so I'm I'm confident that he got it uh, whatever it was you know cryotherapy is used to or cryosurgery is used to remove warts it's used to remove uh, all kinds of things okay there's some inflammatory disorders there's contact dermatitis um, so this is skin inflammation without infection um, so it can be caused by any sort of irritation or exposure to an allergen the most common ones are cheap metals that have a lot of nickel in them so that's why cheap jewelry will give you an inflammatory response so you don't want cheap earrings and uh, if you're sensitive to that kind of thing uh, nickel is an important uh, catalyst in organic chemistry it changes alkanes into alkenes um, but that's another st story it doesn't matter um, but it can catalyze reactions within the, the chemicals of your skin uh, so you want to avoid nickel a lot of people are allergic to certain things in cosmetics with the various components um, things in soaps plants so like poison ivy poison oak uh, can cause contact dermatitis um, you get sensitized the first exposure and then you get the next exposure you you will get the rash and it's really very itchy um, whatever irritates you remove the irritation and re reduce the inflammation with topical glu glucocorticoids so um, prednisone cream or you know, steroid cream here's a picture of somebody who had contact dermatitis from tape um, it happens people are get irritated by that kind of stuff hives um, are called urticaria um, it's a type 1 hypersensitivity uh, it often happens when people have food allergies it's they they break out in hives um, a common one for that is shellfish you have to be careful uh, 
when you have hives, it's very itchy. The lesions are uh, are very itchy, and so sometimes you will break the skin by scratching them uh, and can risk secondary infection. You also have to be careful because anaphylaxis, which is a much more serious thing than hives, lead to hives as well. Um, so if somebody has this type 1 hypersensitivities, then they know it, they should be carrying an EpiPen. There's other kinds of hives, like a, just a hypersensitivity. There's one called dermographia, uh, where you can actually, because the, the uticaria, the hive, raises up and wheels up because of... Um, because of mechanical pressure on the skin. So you can write on, on people. I've had two patients with dermographia, and my mother had dermographia for a while. It seems to come at times of stress. Okay, so um, this is eczema, uh, which is an atopic dermatitis. So atopic dermatitis is an inherited thing. It runs in families. Um, the rash is red. It sometimes uh, will have a, like a watery exudate, face, chest, and shoulders. Um, it can be scaly and, uh, and itchy, and we usually see it on the flexor side, so on the outside of your elbow, on the palm of your hand, soles of your feet, that kind of thing, behind the knee. So it's a chronic inflammation. So that means there's some tissue change um, response to, to exposure to allergens. Um, the biggest worry about it is that it's so itchy, people scratching can get secondary infections or it'll cause cracks and fissures um, that can also be portals of entry. So we treat it with glucocorticoids and antihistamines because it is primarily an inflammatory condition. That's why it's dermatitis. So you've seen things that look like this. A lot of times people uh, mistake dermatitis for psoriasis Psoriasis is different. It's a chronic inflammatory skin disorder. Um, it's from abnormal T cell activation. Uh, and what will happen is the keratinocytes start proliferating in an area uh, really greatly. So they become raised uh, plaques. Um, the itching and burning feeling um, and it is really an autoimmune disorder. It's abnormal T cells. It happens in patches, uh, and it um, and it can lead to arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, which is more of a musculoskeletal thing. It's usually treated with uh, with glucocorticoids, so prednisone, and for some reason, tar preparations on the skin seems to help. Um, the anti-metabolites uh, help break down some of the waste products that maybe cause the inflammation. Um, and there's a, a question as to whether people that are prone to psoriasis have trouble disposing of metabolic waste uh, in the skin. It happens in, pla in plaques. Um, I'm sure you've all seen it. One of the things that you have to remember about psoriasis is that it's not contagious. It looks terrible. Uh, people are really very self-conscious about it. Uh, and as healthcare practitioners, we worry about touching skin lesions. But this one, uh, for all the, that it looks, is not contagious. It is an 
autoimmune problem within that person. <clears throat> Contagious things are things like skin infections. Uh, so the skin can get infected by bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, uh, just about anything. It tends to be opportunistic, uh, and it tends to get in through minor abrasions or cuts. Um, they can develop into serious infections. Um, and to treat them appropriately, you need to know what the causative organism is. Now, luckily, different organisms produce different types of lesions. So oftentimes you can do it from history and observation. Sometimes you have to culture them. So a common one is cellulitis. Um, so this is an infection of the dermis and subcutaneous tissues. This isn't um, epi epidermis, it's in the dermis. So um, it usually happens because of an injury and a break in the epidermis. And the um, organism, usually it's Staphylococcus aureus, usually it's Staph aureus, Sometimes it can be streptococcus, uh, and you've got to be careful about the streptococcus more than the other. But, um, and it causes inflammation and infection of the dermal layer of the skin. It's a big problem iatrogenic, post-surgical. Um, my uh, mother-in-law had a knee replacement done. And she was complaining about it. And I looked at her knee and she had a, quite a bit of cellulitis, cellulitis originating around the, uh, the incision. It, um, it responded quite nicely to antibiotics and, you know, and it ended up being nothing. But if you leave it, um, it will spread. Uh, and, uh, the amount that it spreads, you'll, you'll see pictures. What they do is, with a pen, you outline the area that's inflamed. And then hours later, you look and see if it's bigger than the ink uh, that shows that it's spreading. Um, this can be really bad in the lower limbs because of uh, blood stasis and that kind of thing. Um, immunocompromised individuals, you have to really watch out for. Um, so people on prednisone for anything, uh, you know, COPD and that kind of thing. The area becomes red, swollen, painful. So it's got the cardinal signs of uh, inflammation. Now, if the, um, the cellulitis, if the staph aureus gets down into the lymphatic vessels, it can move along the lymphatic vessels and you will get red streaks, red lines running along the lymphatic vessels in the area of the, of the infection and you can see them. We used to call that blood poisoning, even though it's lymphatic. Um, and it, it's quite dangerous because once it gets that into there, it can become systemic and lead to uh, a sepsis. So this is what cellulitis looks like. Um, and you'll notice that it is extending down here into the lymphatics, but this is the cellulitis up here. It can very dramatically follow the, the lymph, like this. Um, that's the lymph drainage, and uh, so it's lymphangitis, which means lymph vessel inflammation. So, 
The biggest thing about cellulitis is that it's iatrogenic, is a very common cause of it. And so it's something that as healthcare practitioners, we have to be on the lookout for. Boils. It's often staph aureus as well. Um, it's the infection gets into the hair follicles and creates um, almost an abscess. Um, it's a boil. Um, any place where we grow hair, it can happen, but most often it's on the face and the neck. Um, and they weep, they drain, purely exudate, um, pussy, right? Now, what often happens is they get itchy and you feel them, and so the natural tendency is to give them a squeeze. Um, and that can actually spread the infection. Uh, first off, by getting the purulent exudate on adjoining skin, but also uh, squeezing them sometimes will push the, rather than the, the exudate coming out the top to the surface, it will push it deeper into the tissue. And it also can cause cellulitis. So uh, if the boils start to coalesce, we call them a carbuncle. Um, it becomes a large infected mass. So there's a boil. Uh, on the top of somebody's foot. These start to become carbuncles. Um, Impetigo is a um, common infection in kids. Um, it's very highly contagious. Um, it is again Staph aureus. So luckily, a lot of this is Staphylococcus aureus. Um, the lesions are usually around the nose, um, and transmission comes from physical contact or fomites. Um, it, the biggest problem is that it's itchy, so it leads to scratching, and the scratching will lead to further infection. Uh, it gets under the fingernails, and then someplace else you touch will, will get infected. Um, it tends to crust over, uh, and it seems to be related to runny noses. Um, so you treat it with topical antibiotics, uh, and if the lesions become extensive, you have to uh, treat it systemically. The biggest problem is that uh, we're getting antibiotic resistant strains of Staph aureus. So it looks like this. This is a particularly nasty case. Uh, and getting a child of this age to not touch them is, is tough. Acute necrotizing fasciitis. So, um, this is severe inflammation and necrosis uh, that happens at a site of infection. Uh, it gets down into the connective tissue of the fascia. A beta-hemolytic beta streptococcus is the... Um, causative thing. Um, this is also called flesh-eating disease. And so what happens is the bacteria secrete toxins, and the toxins break down the connective tissue, break down the collagen, and get massive tissue destruction. And it doesn't take a large trauma or infection to start this. But once it starts, it's tough to treat. Um, I'm going to warn you, the next couple of pictures are not pretty. So 
This is necrotizing fasciitis. It is um, like we're starting to see some gangrene in there. Um, this is pretty extensive. A few years ago, the premier of Quebec had this from a minor trauma and ended up having to have his leg amputated. Obviously a bad, and another bad one. So these are necrotizing fasciitis. The sooner you get the treatment, the better, because there's time, there's more tissue loss. Um, if it gets, if it goes systemic, it, there's a high probability of mortality. Um, you end up with a toxicity uh, and organ failure. So you treat it with aggressive, aggressive, aggressive antimicrobial therapy. Uh, people leak, and so fluid replacement is, is huge. And you have to excise all of the infected tissue, so you have to cut away anything that has, um, and that might mean the whole limb. The next one we're going to talk about is leprosy. This is caused by a mycobacterium, so it's a bacterial disorder. It becomes chronic. Um, it's um, the clinical symptoms usually affect skin and mucous membranes, but it's a loss of peripheral nerves, so they people with leprosy can't feel their extremities. Damage can lead to the loss of limbs. Um, we don't really know why this happens. When I mean, you consider that this is the disease that's talked about in the Bible, like you would think that leprosy, we'd know more about it, but we don't. Um, we diagnose it with skin biopsies, and now treatment is primarily with antibiotics. It used to be isolation, uh, but so it's not very contagious, even though it's bacterial, uh, and it's very, there's a huge long incubation period. Sometimes it, they feel that it's 20 years between um, contracting and the first symptoms. Um, it varies wildly with people. There's three types. There's tuberculoid, there's lepromatous, and there's borderline. The tuberculoid one is if the immune system deals with it um, and there's relatively few lesions and mild disease and limiting and it's not very contagious. The lepromatis is the um, one that you think of uh, when you think of leprosy. Um, the immune system does not deal well with it. And borderline is in between. Some areas seem to be lepromatis and some seem to be more tuberculoid. Um, people can be in contact with people with leprosy and not catch it. Uh, it is not very contagious. The contagion comes from direct contact though with the lesions. So viral infections. Um, herpes is, is an important one. There's herpes simplex, type 1 and type 2. So type 1 is cold sores, fever blisters. Type 2 is genital herpes. Uh, <coughs> they are both similar. Um, the primary infection may be asymptomatic. So what happens here is the virus, as we know, um, viruses have to go inside cells 
and take over the uh, protein synthesis of the cell. When that happens, the natural killer cells and the cytotoxic T lymphocytes kill the cells that are infected. And so that cell disappears. And that's what actually causes the lesion. When the virus is in the interstitium, the phagocytes eat them and destroy them. The herpes viruses have figured out that, by accident, somehow, uh, they take advantage, advantage of retrograde trend, uh, propulsion in nerves. So they will go into a nerve uh, and then take the retrograde uh, back to the, the cell body of the nerve, the neuron cell body. So that would be in the ganglion, uh, in the sensory ganglion. So that's the dorsal root ganglion of the spinal cord. And it'll stay there in a latent, um, in a latent way. Safe from the immune system because the immune system can't kill nerve cells because we can't replace them. Uh, so uh, they will sit there latently. Stress, sun exposure, uh, other viral infections will cause them to the, this virus to leave the ganglion, go out to the nerve endings, and then uh, infect the epithelial cells around it. The epithelial cells is where the uh, virus replicates and where the immune system attacks them, causing the lesion. So here's a, a cold sore. Uh, that's the herpes lesion. The virus is in those lesions, so it spreads by direct contact. Uh, It can happen before the appearance of the lesion, when, when you're shedding the virus, um, and before the immune system starts to attack and form the lesion. Um, one of the real complications of this is it tends to be itchy and burning, and you tend to scratch it, so you can get it on your, finger, in your fingernails, and then if you touch your eyes, it, the virus can spread to the eye and uh, cause keratitis, which we've already talked about. Um, another thing that it can cause is something called Whitlow, herpetic Whitlow, which is really lesions in the tips of the fingers. It's the, um, it's the same as the cold sore, except on your fingertips, and they're quite painful. So the virus enters the cell, it replicates within the epithelial cells uh, and spreads to adjacent cells. Uh, the immune system causes the necrosis and the vesicles form. So you get the lesion. The virus then goes into the nerve, into the sensory ganglion, uh, and then comes out at times of stress. It tends to be uh, the ganglion, if it's in the cranial nerves, it tends to be the trigeminal nerve, which is why it goes to the lips. The same thing happens in genital herpes. Warts uh, is one of a number of viruses, but they're all called HPVs, human papillomavirus, virus, papilloma virus. So that's a wart, papilloma. Um, plantar warts are on the soles of the feet. They're a different virus than the common wart. Uh, 
it spreads by the skin surface. They resolve spontaneously often. Usually you have to get them burnt off. Uh, you can have genital warts. Uh, and genital warts can lead to circular can uh, cervical cancer. Um, they should be dealt with. Plantar warts are here. So like I say, they normally get burnt off. Fungal infections are important, so mycosis. Usually it's superficial. Um, candida will happen in people with diabetes, mainly because the amount of sugar available uh, makes them opportunistic. Um, if you're immunocompromised, uh, the danger is that it will spread systemically the immune system won't take care of it um, you diagnose it by scraping and looking at it under uv light culturing the samples um, there's probably more people with candida than you would care to imagine because i think a lot of them are reasonably asymptomatic uh, and it gives various skin lesions Tinea is important. Um, tinea capitis is a fungal infection of the scalp. Uh, it turns red. Uh, the best way to deal with it is antifungal medication. Um, tinea corpus is uh, on the body. It's called ringworm. Uh, it's itchy. We treat it topically um, with antifungal medications. Um, it has, so it's a round lesion with a clear center. That's why it's called ringworm. Tinea pedis is athlete's foot, uh, feet and toes. We get it oftentimes at barefoot in swimming pools or locker rooms. Um, then part of normal flora becomes opportunistic. Um, biggest problem with that is that it causes cracks and fissures that can become infected. It's itchy, so you, you scratch, which can cause infection. Uh, topical antifungal medication is usually used, so a little ointment. Um, tinea ungaium is nail fungus. Uh, toenails, but it's all fungal. So there's a tinea capitis. There's a bad case of athlete's foot right there. There's fungal toenails. Um, so there's other infections by parasites. Scabies are an important uh, consideration. I was teaching at a massage therapy school many years ago when one of our students ended up having scabies and so we had to disinfect everything. Um, it's a mite and what happens is these little mites burrow into the skin, into the epidermis and lays their eggs um, and then they eat your keratinocytes. And as they eat your keratinocytes, they poop, and the poop causes itching. It causes inflammation. So it's very itching. Um, and, and they burrow in lines up your skin. So you get these brown, light brown lines. Uh, happens oftentimes around the wrists and ankles, mostly around the wrists. Um, so the little microscopic insects, there's a picture of them. Uh, this is a baby with scabies. You will see them as little vesicular rash here. And it's the, this is the insect actually burrowing into the skin. Pediculosis is lice. So we have body lice. Uh, is corpus. 
pediculosus humanus capitis is head lice. Uh, this is the one that makes its way through grade school classes. Um, pubic lice uh, is pediculus humanus pubis. These are not the same insects. They are similar, but they're not the same. They they lay eggs on the hair shaft, glue them to the hair shaft. Uh, those are called the nits. Um, and after they hatch, they bite uh, and suck blood, which then causes, well, they bite and they suck the blood, but their saliva contains an anticoagulant so that the blood will flow, and that's what you have the itching reaction to. And then you scratch, and as you scratch, you, you tear away skin and open it to opportunistic infections. You can see the little nits in this person's hair. Uh, getting the most is nitpicky. Um, a friend of mine, uh, his wife is a Filipina, she's from the Philippines, and uh, when their kids first got lice, she wanted to know where she could find a monkey man, because I guess in the where she's from in the Philippines, there are people with trained monkeys that uh, will sit on somebody's shoulder and pick all the nits. Um, we tend to use combs and colada shampoo and things like that. Um, vinegar and olive oil concoctions and, and stuff. But skin tumors are important. Um, there are some benign lesions, uh, benign tumors associated with aging or sun damage. Um, that are very common. Uh, one is called a seborrheic keratosis. And this is basal cells multiplying far too quickly. Um, it leads to an oval elevation. Usually the surface, because it's keratinocytes, is loose and it can be rough. It will it'll come off. Um, it tends to be very light in, col in, in color and uh, they stick around for a long time and they don't mean much. They're unsightly. People get, if you have more than one or two of them, you get worried about them. But um, from a, strictly from a, uh, that's gross uh, point of view. The actinic keratosis is um, sun damage, especially in really fair-skinned persons, and you get a pigmented scaly patch. Oftentimes, they're almost black. You'll see them on, uh, like, on the torsos of of people that spent time sunbathing. Oftentimes, uh, older women, um, and. They're really very unsightly patches. Now, actinic keratosis in themselves are benign, but they can develop into more um, malignant forms. So they can give rise to basal cell carcinomas and things. So this is the seborrheic ones. Um, there's some actinic ones mixed in here. That's an actinic one here. And, but most of these are seborrheic. You often see the actinic ones on the tops of the heads of old men. Anybody that you, anybody who works in an old age home has seen lots of these. Uh, So how do you not get them? Well, you start 40 years before they appear and avoid the sun. Uh, cover up with clothing, wear hats and sunscreen, sunblock. Uh, so the three types of skin cancers, the malignant skin cancers we're going to talk about, 
are the squamous cell carcinomas. Um, and they're painless, but they're a malignant tumor. They're slow growing. Uh, they're found on exposed areas of the skin. So on the face, on the nose, on the neck. Uh, it says base of tongue. Uh, but um, it's going to uh, probably arise from a, uh, a keratinic. So, these things get removed and prognosis is excellent because they're not very malignant and they, they don't spread by metastasis, they spread by invasion. It tends to erode in the center. See how it's, it forms almost an ulcerative lesion in this picture? Um, so yeah, it happens face, hands, exposed places. A basal cell carcinoma is this. The, they tend to sting. It tends to be recurrent. The lesion will disappear and then reappear. And it has these little pearl, pearly edge around the center ulceration um, and it is the basal cell that causes it again slow uh, developing and not terrible for metastasis melanoma on the other hand is highly metastatic uh, and it develops in the melanocytes Moles are collections of melanocytes, so moles tend to be the starting point. Now, you get, they tend to be multicolored lesions growing quickly, so they change in shape, color, size, texture. They can bleed if you bump against them. Um, you have them cut away, and if it's large enough and they biopsy them, then you will probably get radiation and chemotherapy. So we, we talk about the ABCDEs of melanoma. So if it's asymmetrical in shape, uh, if there is a lack of border, so a mole will have a very distinct border, a melanoma it's less distinct what is colored and what is normal tissue. So the, the border changes. Color, the melanomas tend to be multicolored, where a mole tends to be single in color. They get bigger, so increase in diameter. And they're always changing, so that's evolution. So asymmetry border, color, diameter, and evolution. So you can see, uh, and sometimes E stands for elevation, but you can see how it's multicolored and you're not really certain where the border is. It's elevated. Um, it's uh, fairly large in diameter. And it's asymmetrical. There's no. So there's the malignant melanoma. Carposi sarcomas are becoming more uh, known because it's immunodeficiency, so AIDS. Um, it affects viscera, not just skin. Um, so it's malignant cells in the endothelium and the blood vessel. You get these macules, purplish, uh, so they're not raised. They're non-itchy and they're non-painful. But these les lesions go all over the body. Um, so they're treated with radiation chemotherapy. 
um, biological therapy, but they're indicative of other things. So that's what they they look like. So that's it for skin lesions.